We've still not shown you inside there, but we will. We're walking to Bolton Abbey this morning. Just have a look round. Whether that'll be in this video or a separate video, yet to be seen. Probably a separate video, won't it? Possibly. Bit of a failure this morning, so might get a bit of wind noise because the microphones hadn't charged. <clears throat> That'd be a nice place to live. It's two places. Oh, we'd have to have it as one. <laughs> you have to talk louder than that, we've not got microphones. <laughs> Daffodils are nicely out, yeah. enjoying the sunshine. So we're on our second full day in Yorkshire. And we've got blue sky. And a bit of warmth in the sun. Yes, spring has sprung. Or it's springing, one of the two. <laughs> Around the bend, not too far from where we're staying. Just down there, you won't really see it yet. It's the first view we've got of the Abbey. Of course, there's a fair bit of history to it. Being that old. So, we're coming just down this path towards the the river and again another view of the uh, Priory Abbey a lot of it is in ruins but there is a, a church there a parish church it's all on the Bolton Abbey estate obviously now we're getting a view of it With our new camera, and we've got the uh, DJI Osmo Action 4, which we're not using today. We've left it at home because we still need to get used to it. But it has got a zoom in, so we'll be able to zoom in a little bit more. Should and when we need to. You've been down here a couple of times, haven't you, with the dogs? I have. Um, so first, this first time I just came to here and sort of looked across. Then yesterday we went the whole way, we went round the abbey just to see what, whether we could get there. And you said it was quite entertaining with Nab? It is. He doesn't like going over the bridge. There's a grave we need to look for here as well. And just before you turn it off, <laughs> there are, or were, stepping stones. Um, presumably, I think, from that sort of section over there, <clears throat> across here. Um, but uh, a tree came down and took some of them out in the storms. And so they're no longer, but you can't see them. There's so much water at the moment, you can't see them anyway. So, he's already in. Right. The bridge don't like a nap.
see it flowing down. Yeah, water into the river. This is Bolton Abbey, or as I would say it, and Keith will laugh at me, Bolton Abbey. We're in Wharfdale in North Yorkshire, and it takes its name from 12th century Augustinian monastery of Canons Regular, now known as Bolton Priory. It was closed in 1539 the dissolution of the monasteries ordered by good old King Henry VIII that must have been a heck of a window though mustn't it it must have mustn't it the monastery was founded as at, at Emsby 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 in 1120, led by a prior, it was technically a priory despite its name. As I said, it was founded in 1154 by the Augustinian Order on the banks of the River Wharf. The land of Bolton, as well as other resources, were given to the Order by Lady Alice de Romil of Skipton Castle in 1154. I was wondering whether they were the old abbots and things. Yeah, possibly. Certainly some of these old ones here. So they're very reminiscent of the ones we've seen at other places, aren't they? Yeah. You can't really make out what they said. These are swords, aren't they? That one is, yes. <coughs> but they, I don't know, that looks like a staff of some sort, mm. I don't know. <laughs> More of them here. They look very stylized, the, 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 the top. That one back there, and again, sort of perhaps a more modern reputation there, but they all have that similar. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not patterning, is it? But yeah. carving or. This is. Well, this side says also of John. Something who died February 16th. Oh, it's not old actually, 18, 1882. This one, is it? All oh, right, that's a usually. <laughs> I know we say it a lot, but it's amazing how much is destroyed of something like this, but 
still how much remains as well. How some of it hasn't collapsed. And it is still a working church, isn't it? Oh, already mentioned Alice de Rumilly. She offered the black cannons of the Order of St. Augustine, the sheltered site of Bolton in 1155. Here they thrived despite various setbacks until the dissolution of their order by Henry VIII. Oh, the aforementioned Henry VIII in 1539. The monastic landscape we see today was part of the much larger monastic estate. There were barns, granges, workshops and orchards together with a mill, bakehouse, brew house and tannery which would have contributed to the economic self-sufficiency of the cannons. In the Priory's heyday there were 26 cannons and, 20, and 200 lay workers. And the income required to support and improve the Priory came from sheep farming and lead mining. At the dissolution the nave of the priory was allowed to continue as a parish church. However, other roofs were stripped off, of stripped of valuable lead, but otherwise left intact. This saved the, the cost of demolition, and for a while some of the associated buildings were rented out. The cellar, cellar, solarium? solarium was known to have been used as a house. So where's the solarium? Here, uh, this bit here. <coughs> so, so that's this this bit this here. This bit here is so yeah. And there is a model in inside of what it used to be, or what they think it used to be like. Oh, you filming me saying it? I was going to read it. <laughs> In the early 14th century, Scottish raiders caused a temporary abandonment, oh, those Scots, of the site and serious structural damage to the Priory. And during the dissolution, or just prior to the dissolution of the monasteries, there was still building work going on here. A tower, which was begun in 1520, was left half standing and its base was later given a bell turret and converted into an entrance porch. Most of the remaining church is in the Gothic style of architecture, but more work was done in the Victorian era, including windows, and as Keith said it still functions as a church and still holds services on Sundays and religious holidays. Just look at the carving in the base of that. So they must have been a fairly wealthy order, mustn't it? They must have been. Because that's not going to have been cheap. No. And it's. That's all I know it, isn't labour it? was cheap in those days, but it's all decorative, isn't it? It's yeah. all the way around. And there's a couple of graves that we want to find while we're here, but. Now we're going to find somewhere to tie the dogs because we're not taking those in, them in. 
and we'll go and have a look inside. No cost for going in. Well, they do ask for a donation. Just a pound. And this is a doorway then and obviously these doors were putting in 1983 this is the tower that was left unfinished and they put a roof in when they restored it I think that was in the 1980s. Was it? Yeah. Modern technology hits the card machine where you can make donations as well as coinage notes carving on me wow yeah graffiti but wasn't graffiti classy back then <laughs> rather than your paints or your markers The nave of the pre-Reformation church ran up to the arch, which you can see behind the altar. We're repeating ourselves a bit, but building began around 1154, and people have worshipped God here continuously for more than 850 years. This bit, yeah. The dissolution also halted the building of the West Tower, which was begun in 1520. It was originally intended to be at least twice its current height, but for four centuries remained incomplete and without a roof. And as Keith said a couple of minutes ago, the modern roof and bell turret were added in 1983, following a substantial local fundraising effort. That must have been some fundraising, yes. fundraising effort. Massive stained glass windows. I'm sure these windows are going to show up too well, but they're fascinating. They were done by in during the uh, Victorian era by August Pugin, um, and I think, if I remember rightly, it's some of his last work. Uh, in, I can't find the ex exact article that I was reading before. Uh, but it was some of his last work. Was he a famous what? Yes. Famous for what? Famous for architecture. Right. So not glass at all? Well, As all such. sorts. That sort of, that, all that sort of uh, stuff. English architect, designer, artist, critic of, with French and Swiss origins. So... He's, he did windows for the palace of, West, of Westminster. So a lot of hope, well, yeah. a lot of religious and royal yeah. type work then as well. And here's a model replica.
obviously we can't fly drones here, so this is about the best drone's eye view that you'll get of what it would have looked like. So this is the nave, the present church that we're in now. And coming over to this side, it's the choir and presbytery. Coming round, we've got the chapter house, the rear daughter, the prior's new lodging. And a daughter, D O R T E R. I don't know what that means. I'll check that one out. Common room, freighter, and around this side, the solarium with Prior's old lodging over. And then this is the unfinished West Tower. And this model's been here or was made in 1956, it was made by the pupils of. Uh, Miss Stead's Grammar School, Skipton, for the octocentenary of the Priory in 1954. These stones below are fragments of the tomb of John Clifford, 7th Baron de Clifford, Lord of Skipton and a former patron of the Priory. Lord Clifford fought at Agincourt with Henry V in 1415 and he was made a Knight of the Garter in 1421 and died at the Siege of Mew, 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 M-E-A-U-X. My French is a Mal. Mal. No, I don't know. In 1422. And his remains are buried in the ruined chancel. The Garter symbol can be seen clearly on one of the stones. And heading up Looking at that small window up there, that window depicts St Cuthbert, Bishop of Lindisfarne. Well, you've seen recently that we're on Lindisfarne, and he was a patron saint of this priory. He's traditionally depicted holding the severed head of St Oswald, King of Northumbria, who was slain in battle by Pendra, Penda, King of Mercia, in 642. Cuthbert would have been eight years old at the time, however, and the two probably never actually met. But the remains of both of them are now interred at Durham Cathedral. And Durham Cathedral is one that is on our list to do at some point. And as with every old church, there's memorial stones. and plaques, names of priors of Bolton, starting with Reginald in 1120. Ministers, starting with William Brockton in 1576. And rectors, I said rectors. And the first name on there is Hugh G. Robinson in 1863.
the stone altar which because of the shape on its sides must have been the high altar the old high altar this is the oldest object in the church and was probably in use when Thomas Beckett was murdered in 1170 as was custom it bears five crosses one in each corner very difficult to see and one in the front which represent the five wounds on the body of the crucified and risen Christ during the Reformation stone altars were replaced with tables many were destroyed but some were concealed this one by using it to cover the entrance to a crypt which is now under the organ after spending nearly a century propped up against the wall of the North Isle, it was again set up as an altar surrounded by medieval tiles, which were found in the cloisters in 1985. Square Hollow. Here. In the centre of the altar, once contained one of the brass plates displayed on the wall nearby, which gave the name of the occupant of the crypt and was held in place by the blobs of lead in the corners. There's a lead. So I presume this is the plaque. Here lies the body of Elizabeth, the only wife of Ophias, Lophias, Iphias, Morley. Gentleman who departed this life 13th of March, oh, on my birthday, 1715, aged 77 years and three months. Oh, Josias Morley. That's it. And here lies the body of Josias, Josias Morley of Scale House, who departed this life on the 6th day of October, 1731, aged 80 years and eight months. And then the body of Mrs. Anne Morley, who departed this life, 21st of November 1746, aged 61 years. So yes, as I say, the blobs of lead held the place, the plaques in place. But the dip in the centre, because there is a bit of a dip, you see it dips down. <coughs> The dip in the centre of the square cannot be explained in this way and raises the interesting possibility that this was originally a sealed altar. Such altars, which are rare, contained a sacred relic that was covered by a thin sheet of stone, which, if the theory is correct, was later replaced by the brass plate. That alcove up, the, ooh, up there somewhere um, is called the Watch Place and it's reached by stairs within the thickness of the wall. And they think that the cannon would go up there and observe while the rest of the uh, priory slept. So he'd, like a, a night watchman guard yeah, type? And he'd keep vigil up there. Mm. For raiders or? I don't know. But I don't know whether you can see. Is that the stairs starting to go up there? Well, yeah. It's by the side of the window? Or is it, it could be, further? But then there's some... It looks like repointed stuff. I wonder whether it's... Yeah. I don't know. You go into churches and abbeys, and there's always so much more than it just being a church, isn't there? Mm. Now, abbey or cathedral with the history and then little secret stories that you wouldn't even think like that. And so there's three glass, stained glass windows on this side. And each of the three windows contains some 14th century glass in the upper sections, so. Against the background of grey glass with fine leaf patterns, there are roundels in red and blue, yellow and green. And you can also see two marvellous crowned heads, which possibly represent Edward III and Philippa of Hainault, his consort, along with a tiny Pachal lamb with its flag. 
The glass probably escaped destruction during the Reformation because it depicted English royalty rather than the band idolatrous images of saints. But the lower sections of the windows were destroyed and they've now been filled in with either 19th or 20th century glass, depicting the stoning of St. Stephen, the burning of St. Polycarp of Smyrna and the death of St. Ignatius in the Roman Colosseum. So that's one of the windows. Here's the second. And the third one, which is quite plain compared to the others, is there. The pews are quite um, plain, aren't they, compared to some pews in larger churches and abbeys, cathedrals. Very not as ornate, are they? So that's the inside. We'll have a little bit further of a walk around the outside and say we've got a couple of graves that we want to find. See how the duo are faring and how patient they've been. Ooh, it's a heavy door. Good boy, good girl. That's the small window I mentioned about from inside. That's looking at it from the outside. And before it was the Royal Air Force, it was called the Royal Flying Corps. And we're looking for the grave of a pilot who is buried here. It's not a jam-packed graveyard, is it? No. Like some, for, for the age of the place. The more recent graves seem to be down this bottom end, so we'll have a look down there. One of the graves we're looking for is really recent. Well, not the last 10 years or so, but a little bit long, older than that. This isn't one of the graves we're looking for, but when you look at old gravestones, there's usually quite nice sentiment carved on them, but not so much on modern ones. But I quite like this one. With love we remember a dear husband, dad and granddad, Ernest Dalesford Wallbank of Intake Farm Emsby, Emsy, Progressive and innovative, inno, inno, progressive and innovative farmer of strong resolve. You don't usually get to see things like that these days. So that's nice to see. And for those of you who don't know, Keith's surname is Ashworth. And we often look for graves with our surnames on, mine being Stocker. And I found a grave here in cherished memory of John Blackwood Ashworth, CBE DSO. So commander of the British Empire and distinguished service officer. We've still not found the grave we're looking for. Keith's found an image of the grave we're looking for on Google, so we'll carry on looking. I'm not sure we're going to find the other one. Well, this is the grave that we wanted to come and see. Frederick Seawood Truman, OBE, cricketer. He was... Yorkshire County Cricket Club and England fast bowler. He's renowned one of the greatest bowlers in cricket history. And he's genuinely fast paced. 
So we've seen a statue when last time we were in Skipton. We did, which we'll put a link to that video he was down also, in the description. He was also a, an outstanding fielder, especially in leg slip. People that know their cricketing terms. Now you see, I come from a family of cricketers, a big family of cricketers who all played uncles, brother, um, cousins, but I know absolutely nothing. I was a big disappointment. Well, the slips are near the wickets, aren't they? The, the three or four right close by, so. And those, those twig things. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they, they, they're the ones that uh, the ball's coming off the, off the bat very, very fast and. It hurts your hand when you catch it. So he's known as Freddie. Everyone knows him as Freddie Truman. He went on to be um, a broadcaster and commentator, didn't he? I have no idea. Yes. Right. On cricket. Let's just put that up. I don't know how uh, clear that'll be. Somebody's put a stone with a picture of him bowling there, I presume. Yeah. That's Freddie Truman's grave. I'm not sure we're going to find the other one. Um, no idea where to look for it, to be honest. So we could be our friend again. Yes. Well, when we get a signal and we've not made notes, we've dropped lucky. See, I didn't make any notes because I didn't know where we were coming. We haven't found the uh, Royal Flying Corps gravestone, but Daryl's found this. Um, Wife of Charles, Sarah, wife of Charles Ibsen. Uh, but down at the bottom, also John Thomas, son of the above, who died as a prisoner of war in Germany, July 28, 1918. So that's a prisoner of war in the First World, World War. War. Yeah, you don't really get to hear about no. prisoners of war from that war, do no. you, as much? But all the, the pictures I've seen, it's, it's this area here. Well, we can't find that grave. We'll finish with this one. A man after our own hearts because he obviously liked border collies. And this is the grave of Joseph Pickersgill, who only died in 2022, aged 91 years. And he was a verger at the Priory for 32 years. Obviously a collie lover with the little ornaments that are there. So that's it for this video about Bolton Abbey Priory. Hope you found it interesting. If you do, please do leave a comment below. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again soon. Bye.